uh, within uh, R2 Digital Strategy Consultancy and responsible for our future of mobility uh, uh, lab. So interesting session today because there is uh, a number of people, as you see, that are going to, uh, to intervene. And also we are starting late and I was told that I should more or less finish uh, only 10 minutes after that the initial time was, uh, was planned. So it's going to be a big challenge. So that means that you have to ask very short questions. Presenters will make to have to make very short presentation and the debate doesn't have to be too lively. So that's an interesting situation. Uh, so uh, before, uh, before the, um, we will start with a small video uh, just to set the scene with regards to the, the future of mobility. And then there will be two uh, parts to this uh, session. First of all, we get four very interesting presentations by four speakers, which will speak about four new mobility solutions or four technologies that are being uh, developed. Uh, after which we will have a debate with four other uh, panelists uh, reflecting about uh, what, is to the, what is to happen in order to change the mobility uh, paradigm. But before uh, that, uh, let, let us show a, a short video to set the scene. There's supposed to be a bit of sound. Hope you enjoyed the short, uh, the short video, and, and I think the key message, uh, what we need to remember uh, from this video, and, and can you please put the presentation, uh, please, um, is that actually there is really a need for a change of uh, mobility paradigm. Uh, what we see and what we will see in a few seconds, uh, if the, my presentation is being, uh, is being projected, um, is that there is a number of trends. There is a number of global trends. It's related to uh, urbanization. It relates to, well, technology is not always working either. Interesting. Lee, do I need to open this? Okay. So there's lots of changes happening driven by uh, a number of, uh, of trends, technological trends, societal trends. And the key question is, are we at a tipping point again? I mean, I always like to use this picture of the Easter parade in New York City. What you see is two pictures of the same street. On the left, you see the year 1900. And you see there was only a uh, carriage and one motor vehicle. And you see 13 uh, years after, it's actually the opposite. I mean, there is only motor vehicle and you see one carriage. So the question is, what will happen 13 years from now? Uh, will there still be cars in our streets? Or will we live in a world with micro-mobility, with car sharing, with a different way of, uh, of moving uh, in cities? And as I mentioned before on the next slide, this clicker is not working. Uh, it's all driven by a number of trends. What you see on the left are the usual mega trends of urbanization, digitalization, individualization, and sustainability. But what we see right now is the conversion of two interesting things. Number one, we see a lot of behavioral, societal trends, which are changing actually uh, the demand uh, for mobility. People are expecting mobility to evolve. People are looking for new uh, solution. And at the same time, you have new technology. New technology, which is mainly autonomous connectivity, 
uh, alternative form of energy and, and speed. Uh, all those technology actually allows uh, new solutions uh, to emerge. And on the next slide, you see that when you put those two together, actually, uh, you end up with uh, new mobility uh, solutions. I won't go into the detail. I don't have time now. But it's a very interesting uh, situation uh, that is coming now. Just, just taking into account those different trends, you see that different mobility solutions uh, are emerging. But maybe to set the scene, it's also interesting to look at the current situation, because we're all getting very excited. We all speak about mobility as a service, new mobility. Uh, but at the same time, what we see is that uh, many cities, most cities, are still heavily congestioned. What we see, if we look at, uh, and we have some, those are data from TomTom. -Tom. Uh, I think we have someone from TomTom -Tom that will speak uh, later on, and there is some new data available in the meantime. But what you see is that, for instance, in Europe, there is a 1.3 increase per year of congestion, uh, if you follow the TomTom -Tom, uh, index, which means that after 10 years, you know what it means. I mean, because it's exponential. Which means that there is lots of new things. No, no the question is, um, it's not yet uh, solving the situation. And uh, you saw in the introduction that Arthur De Little has made a urban mobility index looking at 100 cities uh, worldwide. We look at maturity and we looked at innovativeness and performance of mobility systems. And the conclusion is that half of the potential is still unleashed. So there is still a lot to do uh, to, make it, uh, to make it happen. And we see new mobility is part of the solution, surely. I mean, lots of our competitors have made study looking at, okay, what will be the share of new mobility by 2030? Some, did, some take less risk than others, as, as you can see, uh, 16 to 98 percent. I mean, this is probably going to be right. Um, but uh, what we see as well is that if it's not regulated properly, I mean, there is a high risk, obviously, uh, that we get into a uh, mobility uh, jungle. And thereby, as a final slide uh, for the introduction, I think there's lots of questions that are being raised. There's questions related to the adoption of new mobility solutions. There is questions related to the evolution of the ownership model. There are questions related to how this will all integrate uh, with existing uh, mobility solutions and public transport specifically, and how the value will be shared uh, in, in the future. And altogether, how can we actually ensure that we develop a mobility system that is sustainable and, and durable? So that is it for my uh, short, uh, short introduction. I will now give the floor uh, to, uh, to the four speakers, and I think uh, we're going to start with Mr. Alexander uh, Lewalt from uh, CAPS, senior advisor over there, uh, which will tell us about a lot of interesting things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francois. Is this working? Yeah, uh, it is working. Great. So I will do my best to stick to the five minutes. Um, let's see. I used to be a board member and the CTO of this company. Now I'm an advisor. It's much easier to talk as an advisor. We are serving cities and road agencies across the world. So you can't take me um, kind for granted any longer. Um, but I will do my best to lead you through some things that I observed over the last few years that I really believe it will make a change. I think... Um, no. Let's don't talk about the problem. We all know the problem. Let's talk about the solution, right? And I was very encouraged here in the forum to see that also city officials are saying, hey, we can make a change and we can do the better. And I really believe that technology can help us in two dimensions. The first one, we do have ubiquitous connectivity today. 5G is nice and we are in, engaged in 5G and we did a connected highway in Denver with cellular V2X, but we don't need to wait for it and I will make my argument why. And then if you have ubiquitous connectivity and if all resources in transport are connected, then you basically have a constraint optimization problem because on one hand, you have the transportation resources and you have the network. And then you can think about demand management in a different manner. In the same way, we have seen that <clears throat> companies could uh, organize in a totally different manner around ERP in the same way, I fundamentally believe things will happen in transportation and mobility. So let's talk first a little bit about um, ubiquitous connectivity and what's possible with ubiquitous connectivity. I think one of the points that is currently emerging is the curb, right? 
think about me. I came here and I uh, was uh, had the luxury that the host um, um, arranged my transfer from the airport um, to the city, but I talked to my family and I said, we need to come back here. It's a great city. So maybe we come back sometime soon and maybe I take a rental car or um, even better, a, a car from any time. And then I, I drive in the city, but I don't, I can't read the parking policy, right? So I might have an excuse, but if you digitalize the curb, if you digitalize the parking policy, then you can do totally different manners. On the first level, <clears throat> you get rid of these excuses. Secondly, the Ubers of this world, you can direct them and you can have drop off and pick up zones at certain points during the day. But furthermore, I think the curb is a very prestigious real estate in the inner city and it's totally underappreciated. So you could even use it in the mornings for delivery but at noon time for food trucks. So as soon as you have digitalized the curb, you have totally different means how you can manage it. And I think we are seeing this is happening. And I promise you, if I'm here again, if I should be invited again in a few years, this is mainstream. <clears throat> the second point is, uh, I think in the moment we focus very much on kind of the cars, on e-scooters and these kind of things, but I think we need to to realize that also the pedestrian and the cyclist today is connected. All of us, we have our smartphones, so the people are connected. And in some of the trials we have done over the last few years on, uh, and that's the next point, um, uh, vehicle to uh, anything communication, you can show that you can increase safety, road safety substantially by including the vulnerable uh, road users. And the last point is um, the um, infrastructure. Road infrastructure is a big problem because it's non-standardized. <clears throat> the way the signal um, of a street, the, the traffic signal, is handled in a different way in Moscow than in Munich, than in Paris, than in New York. If you don't normalize it, it's very hard for the autonomous car to deal with this. That's where we have an investment and we work together with TomTom, Tom, trying to predict the switching faces at traffic lights. That's just one example where I think road infrastructure, because it did grow over 30, 40 years, is not normalized, but it needs to be normalized to make sense out of it on the digital world. So, can you, can you switch to the next page, please? So much about ubiquitous connectivity. Let's go to the other side. So I mentioned all of a sudden you end up with a pretty complex constraint optimization problem. And just want to give you three examples of how on a small scale we are trying to deal with demand management. Let's go to the next one, please. Somehow this thing. Oh, here we go. This is Austin, Texas. Who of you um, have experienced pool lanes in the US? So a pool lane is nothing else than the idea that you'd make better sense of a resource means a roadway. Uh, reality shows that the US people were not really willing to come get into a car, two or three of them. So there were the pool lanes from the 90s onwards, but they were not really used. So then there was this idea, let's turn a pool lane into a managed lane. And so people were then allowed if they would pay money to use the pool lane. But then the issue was, this is a static thing. And how do you determine the price? So what we came up with together with the Austin Road Authority is the idea that you do dynamic pricing. So depending on the traffic on this pool lane, on this managed lane, you increase and decrease the price uh, by every two minutes it's adjusted. And if you do so, uh, you can guarantee and it's live and it's working a certain throughput on this lane. And I think this can be the beginning of a bigger thing where you see you can steer traffic via financial uh, means. Can we go to the next one? <clears throat> the next one again talks about the curb because I really feel the curb is something that is becoming major. And what you just see on the right hand side is some idea, you can't really see it honestly. Um, so I will try to explain it. So in the morning hours between midnight and 6 a.m. in the morning, uh, you might want to use the curb uh, for delivery purposes and you will allow delivery trucks to go there. At the same time, this means you might restrict um, this curb for delivery at other hours of the day. In the mornings, um, people might come into the city and uh, you might want to have um, drop-off and pick-up zones at the very same real estate. 
but at noon time, you don't want to have the pick up and drop off zones, but you want to use the very same real estate maybe for food trucks. And in the evening, that's just what's indicated, you might turn the whole thing into kind of a um, living space where you have something like a restaurant, you have a community. So this is possible as soon as you digitalize the curb. And can we go to the last one? The last one is more or less talking about what Francois and others have talked in the previous session. This is mobility as a service. And if you take the whole idea about mobility as a service is, number one, you talk about shared resources. Number two, you go across different modes of transportation. Um, and then the third thought is, if that's true and if that's possible, maybe uh, you could even think about that you steer then mobility across the city by financial incentives. And the financial incentive could then be linked, for example, uh, to climate change. And given that we come out of electronic tolling, we feel we have a strong idea on this because tolling does not necess necessarily mean that you collect money, but you could even give money. Right? So if people would decide in their very personal mobility need to not go during rush hour, but earlier or later, maybe they earn certain points that they could basically then use to do and, and get on a mass transit some other time. Thank you very much. Um, these were some thoughts from my side. Thank you very much. Very uh, interesting. Uh, I would like to introduce the second speaker, which is uh, Oliver La. Uh, research unit led from Wuppertal Institute, which will talk about sustainability in, uh, in transport. Great. I might just go closer to where the source of the clicker is. Okay. Do we um, have the presentation? Great. Fantastic. So thank you very much for having me. And uh, um, so this is about... Um, that's not my presentation, unfortunately. Um, no, that's... Um, could, <laughs> could we just swap the order quickly and I'll just... Yeah? Okay, good. Great. Very good. Then, then I propose that uh, Asaf Biderman makes his presentation because it seems this one is ready, uh, which will uh, be about uh, micromobility and the work of super uh, pedestrian. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, would you go to the uh, previous slideshow, please? Yeah, all right. Um, so, hi, everyone. I'll try to pack this into uh, my seven minutes. A, about, a, what is it, 16 years ago, um, I joined my colleague Carlo Ratti at MIT, and we founded a lab called Sensible City Lab. And there, the focus... Uh, is on using new technologies, machine learning, AI, robotics, to solve major urban problems. So at the lab, I was in charge on um, in charge of partnerships, um, and uh, ran about half the projects till 2013, where I spun off a company called Super Pedestrian, which focuses uh, specifically on micro mobility, not so much on the operation side, but on a sort of deep tech problem that is now emerging as uh, something that's sort of an enabling platform uh, that will hopefully help us, help us drive micromobility into the mainstream. Let me give you some specific examples. I'm going to skip on much of the problem side because we know this, but I want to zoom in on one thing. So we know that demand for urban mobility is skyrocketing. Now, by the way, this is not a new thing. This is going on since the mid 80s, It's just growing. And our roads are overbooked. So the question is not how do we solve today's traffic? We'll be lucky if we keep today's traffic by the middle of the century. The question is, how do you put three times or so more people on the roads, right? With what we're doing today, it's kind of a non-starter. So about a decade ago, 2008, uh, we did quite a bit of study uh, on the use of pool. So if you look at a random traffic jam, your major underutilized resource is the empty space inside the car, 78% empty space inside a vehicle. And we did quite a bit of study. We looked uh, at about 850 million trips of people uh, from taxi companies later, ride-hailing industry was founded, and wrote what is still today uh, some of the most advanced vehicle dispatch algorithms and tried to combine multiple trips into a single car as a way of capturing that space. Turns out 
that even if you discount consumer attitudes completely, that it's very hard to go above two people in a normal sedan without incurring significant delays to the point that you're actually creating traffic rather than removing traffic. And that's a feature of a city. It's a matter of land use. It's a matter of where people live, where people work. There's not enough overlap between sort of my routine and your routine, so to speak, so that we could share a car uh, most of the time. So if you can't fill up that empty space, what's the other solution? Uh, you have to cut it off, make it small. Right, that's sort of the thesis behind micromobility. When you make a vehicle small, though, you expose a whole bunch of problems that the automotive industry doesn't know how to deal with. Specifically, cost constraint, number one. If you share these vehicles on a network, they need to cost about $500 a piece for the small ones, for the bikes and the scooters. Uh, the larger vehicles maybe go up to $1,000, $2,000 for a small car. That's transformatively different from what the automotive industry builds today. At the same time, these vehicles being shared don't have an owner, so to speak. So you lose the little things we all do to our cars. If you own a car, right, you fuel it, you maintain it, you make sure it's safe, uh, uh, safe to ride. And if you now to tr try to centralize all of this under one roof, under a sharing operation, it actually doesn't add up. It doesn't scale at all. And uh, the economics don't work out. So realizing this, um, we began to focus on a technology to address that problem. And let me be a, a little bit specific. Uh, if you look at uh, what most people agree would be a solution for, for urban mobility in our cities moving on into the future, it's basically multimodality but uh, revamped, right? Where you have on-demand combining with fixed routes, combining with mixed capacities. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit here where I say that this is solved and that is solved and pedestrian is solved. It's not. But relatively speaking, it is, because we know that ride hailing and micromobility uh, are still in their early days big problems. First of all, the companies are still finding it very hard to make ends meet, right? So there's no sustainability yet economically. There are safety issues, there are regulatory issues, use of public space, curbside, etc. So we did quite a bit of work on both at, at the Sensible City Lab. I'm going to focus on these two first aspects. So. Acrobat Reader is telling us something. Can we get rid of that note, please? Um, so if you look at what happened in micromobility, there's a good news. Uh, people love it, right? Riding, willing to pay uh, you know, three, four dollars a ride in, the, in, in Western economies, multiple times a day per vehicle. Uh, probably a reasonable uh, business can be built around it. It's probably a sustainable service if you could solve the cost side of the equation. The other thing is that cities love it. You know, this is just a... Is there a way to get rid of this? I click it. Uh, this is just from re recently from, from Germany. Uh, 58 cities in Germany just allowed scooters. Uh, and, and Germany is the biggest uh, market in Europe, for example, for uh, electric bikes, uh, expansive infrastructure. This is spreading all throughout the world. Now, there's a major problem, though. If you look, this is just uh, an agglomeration of uh, an example of the economics in scooter and, and, and e-bike sharing industry. Every company today, irrespective of where they are, is losing 50 to 100% per ride every day. Right? That's not sustainable. And the main reasons are that the vehicles break too quickly. You need to send a person almost every day to charge one of those things, take it somewhere, charge it, etc. And the repair costs are extreme. Why? Because of what I mentioned at the beginning. It doesn't make sense to take something which was distributed in the, in the past, right? the small operations which we do to our vehicles, and then to centralize it under one roof, where you have to perform little operations, small mechanical operations, or charging, or moving a vehicle, all throughout a city, at random times, in random places, just doesn't add up. The only way to solve this is if you can start to create autonomous technologies that would replace the human element in those, uh, in those fleet management cases. So this is what uh, Super Pedestrian is doing. We started in 2013 in January. It's a team of robotics people, uh, mostly from the world of uh, autonomous maintenance. It's a very narrow field. And we specialize in building technologies that are embedded inside the vehicle. So we redesign from the ground up all the electronics, the basic ones, the motor control, the battery management, but also all data encryption on board. And most importantly, a decision-making system that helps the vehicle predict what might break it and apply self-protection in real time. And I mean in real time, sort of nine nanoseconds is 
about the time window you have to respond before, for example, a battery catches fire if water comes in. Right? So you have a very little time window to act. Let me give you some examples. So inside our vehicles, this is an example of a scooter. We make scooters, we make e-bikes. Our platform goes into any micro vehicle under three kilowatt power. So we wanted to build something that's ubiquitous. It's got an AI component on board, as well as on the cloud that communicates with the vehicles, receiving high resolution data uh, in real time. On the cloud, you perform predictive maintenance aspects, and the vehicle itself does the most important uh, part of the work, which is to predict what would break it. So there's a little, uh, I want to make a small point here. If, you're, if your vehicle costs 500 bucks, your control system costs about $120. It's very, very, very cheap. Now, you're asking these vehicles to do things that cars can't do. Now, you can't solve that problem by putting sensors on everything. You blow your budget, and your control system becomes a failure point in itself. So what we do is actually look at what's called transience. I'm going to geek out for a second with you. Uh, we look at how information flows through the system, the shape of waves in our FETs, in the various electronic components. And we train a vehicle to observe when these waveforms, for example, or measurements change to attribute it to failures that are about to happen. And it's extremely robust. So I'll give you just a random geeky example. So we look at the ripple of a motor uh, in the motor current, right? So the motor current has a shape a wave shape, if that wave shape changes, we know how to attribute it to various types of failures, right? And so basically, in this case, we're attributing a, 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 um, a change in, in current ripple to loss in capacitance, right? People sometimes throw these vehicles off a you know, six-foot ledge. You can break a capacitor. What does it mean? Well, maybe you don't even have to stop. If your vehicle can keep going, service keeps going, it, the vehicle keeps making money, but more importantly, the customers are beginning to be able to rely on these micro-mobility vehicles uh, uh, on, on their day-to-day -day mobility routine, leading to a change of habit, right? Something you can't do today. Today, you're lucky if you find a broken scooter, right? So uh, we attribute this to a broken capacitor. We ask, well, let's measure the capacitance on the system in real time. The vehicle does all of, the, all of this stuff autonomously. It says, it says, oops. Well, it says that it has enough capacitance to keep going, uh, but it has to reduce its own speed limit by 5% and then call for maintenance in the future, right? In 1,000 miles, please replace my motor controller. What happened here, right? We have a vehicle that keeps on working. We have a service that keeps on uh, taking place. And your biggest cost, which is people, that you would have needed to send to the vehicle, pick it up, bring it to a warehouse, open it up, ask what's going on, Typically, downtime today is around 19 days from the moment a problem has occurred on one of those vehicles. 19 days for a vehicle that lives one month or two months. It's terrible, right? So here, nothing. Vehicle kept working. Zero days. Right? So this is just an example. And we do this for over 100 different things. And the result is that the presentation's over. I'll just speak over it. The result is that uh, uh, with this technology, we're able to prevent more than 50% of failures that would break a normal scooter or electric bike from breaking these vehicles. They just keep going. And if they ended up failing, they, they open their own service ticket. They say, hey, here's, where, here's what I need. Here's when I need it. Come find me. So on the ground, your operator crew just basically has an app with a list of inventory that they need to pack out of a warehouse, take it with them, perform it on the field. Within hours, the vehicle's back online. So this is just uh, uh, an example of uh, what Super Pedestrian focuses on. We are, we are now launching a fleet of scooters. We've done a fleet of electric bikes until now. And uh, the business model is that we sell it to the operators. We also partner with cities these days. Uh, there is another interesting aspect of the work, which is we're giving a web tool, an API, for cities so that cities would be able to begin to manage the vehicles themselves. Right? Because one thing is to optimize for maximum ridership, which is income for the operators. The other thing is to optimize for uh, multimodal synchronicity, right, to reduce uh, uh, vehicle miles traveled, right? So if a city can become engaged in the management of those vehicles in a much more intense way, where do they go? What's the speed limit per street? Where can they park? How much power uh, do they output, etc. in real time? Maybe we'll begin to see an impact on the performance of a transport network in a city in real time. There's a lot more that's going on there. Uh, in the future, small vehicles, small cars, mopeds, 
uh, uh, safety system of micro vehicle to vehicle. Uh, so we're just beginning. Thank you very much. Oliver. Thank you. Thanks. It's me again. So, um, uh, giving it another try, that looks much better. Uh, so, I'm Oliver La, I'm based at the Wuppertal Institute and at the uh, UN Habitat, uh, and we run the Urban Electric Mobility Initiative, where we work with uh, partner cities in Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America on, on sustainable urban mobility solutions. And, you know, getting back to that uh, topic of this uh, session about looking into the future, it's interesting to, to compare our sector with uh, the energy transition or electricity uh, transition. Uh, we're quite proud of it in, in Germany that uh, this is working really well, but actually um, they have such an easier job. So they just uh, switch from this technology to that technology, but the energy as a service, the electricity to the customer is still the same. And um, beyond uh, a couple of you know efficiency improvements and and maybe changes in the uh, electricity bill, for the consumer itself, um, the service does not ne necessarily change. And you could consider this in a similar way when we talk about mobility as a service. You only want to go from A to B. But there is a huge difference, obviously, from going with this thing or with that thing. So we don't have the same basics in our sector transition as we have in the electricity sector. So. Um, there are lots of tools and we've heard many of them and we had a great session just before in mobility as a service um, that can enable that and what we've done recently uh, is a little exercise on uh, what this uh, what this transition would entail to with regard to global costs and that sort of gets back to what kind of innovation do we need and very often in, in the uh, transport sector, when we talk about innovation, we talk about the drivetrain, we talk about um, the technology of the vehicle, and we turn from a, a two-ton um, petrol-driven vehicle to a two-and-a-half-ton electricity-driven vehicle, and we think we have done something fantastic on the innovation side of things. And it looks fantastic on, on, on motor shows, and um, the vehicle is, is great, but you really think that is that really innovation from a societal perspective? So if we um, take on an extra element uh, to this, so we have electrified this two and a half ton car and we share it, we have already done a little bit uh, with regard to a more societal benefit from a resource and land use perspective as well as energy. But if we stop first and give it a crucial element of thinking first before we innovate, uh, then we can use that same resources with regard to this 800 kilo um, battery in that two and a half ton car and use that for 90 uh, um, uh, scooters. And if we then share those 90 scooters, then we're really talking about the transformative change. And this is the transformative change that we are looking at. So in that sense, of course, we're looking at a world at the moment where we are going towards two billion cars on the road. That's great from a car industry perspective. Uh, lots of value that can be generated through that. But our cities will be dreadful, uh, will be clogged up, will be losing money, will be losing resources. So we have to rethink the business models of, um, uh, of our sector. And that, that's not new, that happened before. So Nokia used to produce rubber boots, as you know. Um, then there were the market leader, um, and cell phone technology, and then they missed a certain um, uh, innovation towards um, uh, smartphones. And now I suppose they're producing rubber boots again, I don't know. But that's the same challenge that we'd have in the car industry. Um, if we just focus on the vehicle itself, then, then that might be not sufficient. So there are innovations like this, that's an actual thing, I didn't make it up. There's a Volkswagen bike, but of course the value that you can generate from this vehicle, as opposed to that one, is quite a different one. So the value uh, has, has to change and the business model has to change. And they were working on that. So that, that's a, um, a new sort of semi-public service that the subsidiary of Volkswagen is doing and testing in Hamburg with a um, minibus system. And that's uh, what we've played around with a little bit of global uh, numbers. So we're pay paying at the moment around Five trillion euros for uh, five trillion dollars 
for our mobility system. So that's quite a big um, uh, price tag. That, that will increase no matter actually what the scenario is, two, seven and a half, two, seven trillion um, by 2030, just because of the inheritance of, of this very slow moving sector. A car, once it is in the, um, in the fleet, will remain there at least for 10 years, more like 15 years. So uh, change comes, but already if we start now changing, does that point to work? No, but um, already if we compare like uh, the two revolutions, so automation and electrification, and we tend to get hung up on the electricity and, and automation uh, types of revolutions because they are fancier. And then we do see here already that um, the costs uh, related to car travel are increasing quite substantially, as opposed to if we bring in the third revolution, the actual sharing and uh, drive towards uh, public transport and, and non-motorized transport, we still have around about the same price tag in 2030, but spend far less on, um, on individual motorized transport and much more on, on the other modes. And in, in that sense, we still maintain the same level of mobility. What is really interesting is then when we go further into the future and look into 2050, this is where we save annually around about six trillion uh, dollars uh, on our um, annual price tag on transportation. So if, if that would be a country, that would be um, the fifth largest uh, economy in the world. So this is big bucks that we could save if we transform away from a two billion uh, cars on our road uh, scenario towards half a billion cars on our road. Because that's what we really need for, with regard not just to climate, but also resource and land use change. So, and then we, that we can start that with small innovations that we do in our partner cities and it, uh, innovations might be, uh, you know, on the two and three wheeler side as we have them very relevant in, in many of our partner cities, and that's what we do in our Urban Change Maker program. Um, so please uh, join us in the Urban Electric Mobility Initiative. We work with fantastic cities, such as our friends from Madrid who are here, um, and many others around the world. So this peer exchange, we uh, consider this to be quite vital on, on our daily work. Um, and with that, thank you. Thank you, and I would like to introduce our last speaker, which is Mukit Sedakmetov, which is the founder of uh, Anytime. Uh, so, uh, my presentation is in Russian, so I'm sorry, I'll speak Russian, maybe. Uh, okay, F all right, first of all, let me, can you please guide me with, the, with this tool? Okay. Okay, I will try to pack my presentation in uh, five, seven minutes. How does car sharing help to change the, uh, the culture of consumption? What is actually called by sus sustainable economy and what is disruptive car sharing? Let me briefly introduce ourselves. We are a group of companies. We got we got four brands with uh, more than ten thousand cars in our in our fleet. We do car sharing and uh, scooter sharing. Uh, we operate in fourteen cities, uh, three uh, in three countries: Czech Republic, Belarus, and Russia. Uh, and we have more than two and a half million people of two and a half million clients. We have also have. Uh, car subscription subs, subscription based service which should be also a great disruptive system why is this becoming popular well first of all you know as when that's when you joke it is the moment of truth which is most important when you try to uh, play a joke we are called the so-called generation of, uh, of of the renters, the renters generation. Why is this important? For our grandmas and grandpas, it was important to possess something, to uh, purchase something, to have some points of stability, like to to possess a house. But now the girls, the ch and the challenges have changed. 
if previously it was important for you to have one or two cars, uh, build a house, have a swimming pool, now people's goals are changing. People want to go dive in and uh, save the whales, downshift, surf all around the world, etc. So the people's goals are changing and the, the whole paradigm of m mindset is changing. The whole system of uh, what's important for you, of, the, of your, the values, is changing as well. Another thing which is important to consider is the cult of freedom. You, you should not become, you, you are becoming the ownership of, of your own life. You are not becoming a slave of all the things, all the material things that you surround with. It becomes a problem because you become a slave of those things, of those material things. As globalization grows, you can also discover the new worlds and become so-called agile, which means that people want to cut their d dependence on the things, on the material things. That's why the, common the common sharing is becoming more and more popular among people. If we talk about cash sharing, then Moscow is the world's leadership leader, uh, leading city in terms of cash sharing fleet. We have more than 14 cash sharing operators, and one and each uh, share, um, uh, and each car is shared by more than eight to ten people per day which is quite uh, quite a, uh, an impressive number. In, in, in Moscow only, there are more than 24,000 cars already in the fleet. Most of the uh, uh, drivers are the, uh, of the car sharing clients are the men, and most of, and most of them already have uh, their own cars, which means that they which means means that the more cars we suggest, the more cars we introduce into the market, the more sustainable and uh, reliable the service becomes, the more our service will be popular with the clients. Uh, 19 uh, to 35 years old is the average is the average um, age of our clients. What do you call by disruptiveness? This is the change of the paradigm of ownership into the paradigm of service. Uh, uh, the car will no longer be percepted as uh, a, some as a so-called uh, uh, property. It will become uh, some uh, somewhat like Netflix or some commonly used service. It will become an entertainment because everyone will perceive cars as a service, just as a part of this of the service. If we talk about the benefits, one one car in the in the car sharing fleet can uh, 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 can be uh, as uh, much can be as efficient as 8.4 normal cars. If just imagine that if uh, just some of us uh, start using car sharing, we'll have uh, 7.4 uh, parking lots more uh, in each city, which means we will reduce the CO2 emissions by 7.4 times. We'll have 7.4 cars less, which means le uh, fewer traffic jams, less time spent on the on driving, the more effectively we will use the streets and the less time we will spend in order to get from A to B. This is how we can spend, save the time to uh, to, uh, to spend it on the on the on our beloved ones and what we really love. Purchasing car, even uh, getting a credit to uh, uh, buy a car, it means that you hold a quite sufficient amount, quite uh, quite a considerable amount, which is more like uh, 25 trips uh, travels to Turkey or 2.3 years of your education of your study in Moscow State University. Just imagine how much money you can save just by using the car sharing service. Car sharing means freedom. This is 
uh, what car sharing is about. People save more money, they save more money in order to use them on what they really love and become more and more free. This is our main goal and that's what we uh, see our mission at. to be uh, going a bit quicker for the rest of the session, but I would like to uh, to, to invite for 10 minutes uh, Arthur Chakbazayan, Deputy Head of uh, Moscow Traffic Organization Center, uh, Greg Lindsay, Senior Fellow, Head of Mobility, uh, New City Foundation, uh, as well as Ralph Peter Schaffer, which is Vice President, Traffic and Travel Information Product Unit at TomTom. Uh, -Tom. We also had uh, Mikhail Blinken, which I think is not with us. Uh, and I'd like maybe to focus on two questions, one question in general, and then one question specific uh, uh, to you, uh, Arthur, on, 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 on Moscow. Uh, uh, but first of all, I introduce the session by saying, are we at a tipping point again? Do we believe that mobility is going to drastically change uh, in, the coming, in the coming years? Uh, we have seen um, a number of solutions, a number of new technology that are being introduced. Uh, Maybe I'd like to, to, to ask to, to Greg Lindsay, maybe your view uh, about this. Are we, is it going to, to drastically change over the coming years? Thank you for putting me on the spot. Um, well, I mean, the question is, should we be at a tipping point? The answer is yes. I mean, the news that I think of today is the fact that our, our carbon budget before permanent irreproducible climate change, irreversible, is even smaller than we thought. So, you know, there's a whole argument that we should build no more roads, we must electrify everything immediately because of our even shrinking window. So, thinking about the car here and thinking about, I mean, one thing that resonates with me is a soft point that, like, even MIT in 2014 simply could not pool shared rides greater than two people. I thought that was very significant. And I've talked to a number of people who have gotten out of the notion that we'll pool rides and focus on micromobility because, at least from an American context, it's easier to do behavior change if you just give them a smaller vehicle they can have themselves. So yeah, so I would like to think we're at a tipping point where we're going to finally see the realization of this sort of new forms of micromobility, clean, electric, small, personalized, perhaps autonomous someday, and this will become the form factor that will replace the internal combustion automobile or even the electric large size automobile, um, because frankly there's no time to waste. Thank you very much. Um, maybe Ralph Petter. Uh, from from the uh, technology and the connectivity point point of view, what is what is what is your view on the, on this paradigm shift? Yeah, I think uh, absolutely we we are on on big uh, time on transformation, and there are two major drivers. Uh, you see it, uh, the young generation is driving change and want to have drive change and politics for for a greener politics, and you see also in a political spectrum that the uh, parties have an, a greener program moving forward and they win, they win ground. That, that is the society aspect. But there's also a technology aspect. Uh, we, we, we're living in uh, hyper-connectivity. Everybody's connected, cars uh, are connected, and we are moving big time in, in, in transformation uh, process that we use the, the big data and transforming this typical infrastructure thinking many cities still have into something different where the, the, the people uh, come more into the focus, and uh, experiments are happening to to change modal split. And in, in some cities, there are already quite some uh, success. Copenhagen transformed to a bike city. Uh, Singapore was mentioned. Uh, the Nor Nordics uh, are very much in electrification uh, moving forward. And they give me confidence. We are we are moving somewhere, right? But the, the data and connectivity is the, for me the driver of the change and will also drive thinking uh, in, 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 the, in the smart city domain that people from the industry and from the government have to work together. In the past it was a competition game between infrastructure and new technology and now we are really merging in, into a joint uh, ecosystem. If you don't respect us, um, that, that will not work and I, I think we are now at this point where change is happening. I will very much agree. Uh, connectivity integrations between public and private players is extremely uh, important to make it happen. And I'd like to speak to the public uh, players. I mean, uh, um, Arthur, as a deputy head of, of Moscow Traffic Organization Center, I mean, what is what is your view? I mean, first of all, uh, we presented a number of solutions. How do you see them fit 
in, into the Moscow uh, ecosystem? And, and what do you think should be the role of, of, the, of the authority of Moscow uh, to, to contribute to make it happen? Uh, I'll, I'll speak in Russian if you allow. Uh, действительно, технологии сейчас развиваются очень быстро, и есть. Indeed, technologies are developing dramatically, and still there are some uh, things which are missing. Uh, first of all, this is the so-called uh, regulatory base. Uh, and the legal base in order to uh, somehow integrate micro uh, mobility and uh, the social and, and shared mobility into the into our life do we need to uh, do we need to uh, make them commonly used or do we just need to provide some uh, particular uh, usage for 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 these new solutions marketing and new technologies is another point that needs to be considered car sharing is indeed very uh, quickly developing in moscow and micro mobility as well from our side it's it is not obvious that micro mobility can replace your private car just as an example car sharing is uh, quite uh, more that 80 percent of the uh, car sharing fleet uh, is the uh, economic class cars previously most people who couldn't afford themselves to use a car would either either use transport or would go on foot now they have a, a possibility to use car sharing so now most of the car sharing users are not the uh, actual not the current drivers uh, but the uh, pedestrians we just gained uh, a possibility to rent a car without buying a car that's a great way to make your way from a to b without interchanges and that's why we'd love to that's how we'd love to um, share the, 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 this fleet in between not only the pedestrians but but in between the car uh, the actual car users so the question is what do we actually replace with these new technologies yet it's not that obvious probably this is the issue that uh, where we still are seeking for an answer we want the discussion to carry on and probably result in some sp more specific proposals uh, to the extent what these new technologies can offer to our city. The last, as the last questions, actually open to both people sitting next to me as well as the as the presenter. Um, I would like to raise the following: We've been discussing a lot about the supply side, about the new solutions, the new technology, how it could make our life easier, how it could make the cost to serve of uh, micro mobility uh, lower, for instance. Uh, but obviously, in order to get a shift in the way uh, we, we move, we need to also work on the demand. And mobility demand management, some of you have mentioned uh, on your speech, uh, specifically you, uh, um, uh, Alexander, uh, is very important. And, and maybe an open question to, to all of you, both, both on your side and, and here. I mean, how do we make sure that we do the right mobility demand management to, make and to ensure that people effectively shift towards uh, new mobility? Just a quick comment on that, because I, I love that point by Alexander in particular. Not enough people are thinking about the demand management, and we have the tools now for cities to fully understand how the entire ecosystem functions and where they can apply pressure. So, um, yeah, you can use incentives and things. I thought it was very interesting. There was a, there's a tension between two of your points, actually, in your megatrends, this notion of everything on demand and then demand management. I mean, everything on demand is a very individualistic notion. I push a button and a car comes for me or my delivery comes for me. But given the restraints, constraints on geography, energy, climate, um, we're going to have to have some sort of demand management. And you know, pricing is a big part of that. We'll have congestion pricing, curb management. But it's going to be very interesting for cities uh, to really sort of say, you know, these communities must be served. We're going to demand this level of pooling. We have the tools to understand how people are doing it. And I, I think there's going to be, have to be a much more muscular public sector in channeling that demand and imposing those constraints to do behavior change because right now it's yeah it's all individual i i can get whatever i want whenever i want it and and that's about to change i think maybe one comment arthur from a, from a city perspective before we give the floor to the 
next speaker. I think we could spend another two hours on this topic, probably. But <laughs> probably it's it's a follow-up on the point of view that I promoted now. You should manage not only demand but also supply side. And the issue is, let us say, that technology is outpacing regulatory side. There is management of these offers. And the big challenge that the cities are facing now consists in creation of a sort of framework of interaction with the private sector, probably uh, putting in place some uh, municipal operators linked to car sharing or micromobility. At this point in time, it's a big issue, which not only Moscow faces, but also we also face it as well. First and foremost, finding, let's say, mutually advantageous points in the regulatory framework. And secondly, uh, providing for safety, because the priority, the utmost priority of our city is safety. By any of the speaker or presenters? So, so maybe I can, can yes. add to this the demand uh, comment from like, the colleague from New York. So demand can be measured in a way like ever before. Um, for, for road transportation, we measure today uh, the demand of, of uh, every seventh car in, in real time. Uh, there are chip cards for transit where you can measure demand. You have um, car sharing system, taxis, where you can measure uh, demand in any f form which was uh, not happening in the past. That's the ground to, to, to think about um, uh, modal split management which can be accurately done uh, with very good data, and you put your money where you have the biggest bang for buck of change. And that is uh, an, an instrument we are also exploring with the city of Moscow. They're using our data for, for traffic demand management. And that is, is one thing. The second point I want to make, uh, it's not about technology only and big data. It's create a vision in a city, what is good for my city? Because some microservice simply doesn't work. Um, if you have minus 20 degrees, um, it is nice to have uh, e-scooters, but uh, it's only one single element of uh, the, uh, the demand uh, and supply, bring it in a balance. Uh, what's also important to in enhance uh, transit uh, in, in Moscow, the metro line, what's happening. And this is the only way to, to succeed uh, against the, the fight. So the road has to be more expensive. And here are opportunities with new technologies, as I stated. Yeah, I, I think we need to, to stop. I think to those two speakers that wanted to say one more thing and then we will close. Uh, but the, the five seconds, great. So man, in that five seconds, urban planning is a key thing and urban density, fuel taxation, the fuels could be twice as, um, as expensive as well as the vehicle taxation and we can then use that money that we uh, generate to reinvest in our public transport system. Thank you. Thanks, maybe just to add a quick point to your point, Greg, um, that it, the on-demand everything also has an impact on logistics, right? So, and that's a big part of, of what, what's causing congestion, right? The Amazons of the world, deliveries. Uh, I, so I, I do agree that cities have to take a much stronger hand on managing demand, because as autonomy comes in, things will be so cheap, well, I'm actually pessimistic. Demand will explode, right? We need to manage it. So as a closing, as a closing message, I think we spoke a lot about integration. We spoke a lot about connectivity, about supply and demand. And I think also about integration between public and private. And I think to close that, I think that probably one of the solutions is that the public and the private needs to be closer to each other and that the authority uh, of Moscow and other authority need probably to take an important role uh, in that topic, framing, defining the right regulation, but also enabling and making it possible for the different actors to survive in this new uh, mobility. And I, I've seen a lot of great things in Moscow actually uh, in terms of infrastructure development and regulation and I think that hopefully Roscoe can be one of the leaders in this new mobility. So I hope to be there in a few years from now to, to see what will have happened in practice. Thank you very much uh, for being here today and have a nice afternoon.